Just last week, Pastor Andy started us on this My Relationship with Jesus as Our King, as we've been walking through talking about our relationship with Jesus as Savior, as King, and we'll be getting to soon our relationship with him as friend. And we've said that this is kind of based on this very Wesleyan and very historically Christian idea that whenever Jesus came, he didn't just come, die, go up, but he did some stuff in the middle, right? We remember that. If we've been reading along in the Gospels, we'll definitely remember that. Um, But in that time that he was with us on earth, he fulfilled these three Old Testament roles of priest, prophet, and king. And that's how we've kind of adapted that to our modern language to talk about it in a way that can be a bit more conversational. So today, um, as we're going about this relationship with Jesus as a disciple, which we remember here at the Hernando Church of the Nazarene, if Andy has taught us anything, if Andy's taught us anything, we can say this together. The goals of a disciple are to be with Jesus, to become like Jesus, and to do the things Jesus said. Very good. We're getting better at that. I love that. So we understand that as we're pursuing this discipling relationship with Jesus, that there's more than one element to this relationship. And as much as maybe we might like to, we don't get to pick and choose the bits that we like. Um, It's like trying to separate the heads and tails of a coin, we were told last week, that we can't separate our relationship with Jesus as Savior and just take that and leave him as king behind, but that these both come together. And you guys want to know what Andy said last week that really stuck with me this week, that really kind of grabbed my mind, besides the fact that dogs have owners and cats have staff. Uh, (laughs) It went right alongside that, actually. Whenever uh, Pastor, he said that sometimes we have this temptation to reduce our relationship with Jesus from that of a king to that of a consultant. Did anybody else kind of have that stick with them this week? I was praying over that, and I was thinking about that as I was preparing this sermon. And it helped me to realize that this is a very human thing to do. That just like we had this tendency to reduce our saving relationship with Jesus from this everyday walk to restoring everything to just a transaction that's accomplished on you know, one of those decision cards, we have that same tendency with our relationship with king that we reduce him from king to consultant. And it occurred to me that this isn't just a modern, you know, 21st century Christian problem, but that God's people have been struggling with this tendency to reduce our relationship with Jesus and with God for ages. And so as I opened up my Bible, I began to look at what was the first time that the original people of God, the Israelites, just blatantly said, we do not want God to be our king. And so I stumbled on this passage from the book of Samuel that I'm going to have us read together this morning, and I'd like to invite you to stand together as we read from the word of God. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 8. As Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in Beersheba, but they were not like their father, for they were greedy for money. They accepted bribes and perverted justice. Finally, all the elders of Israel met at Ramah to discuss the matter with Samuel. Look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with the request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are not rejecting, for they are rejecting me, not you. They don't want me to be their king any longer. Ever since I brought them from Egypt, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods, and now they are giving you the same treatment. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. Jumping to verse 19, but the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. 
We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. So Samuel repeated to the Lord what the people had said. And the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. Then Samuel agreed and sent the people home. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. We want to be like the other nations. Does that sound innocent to you? They just wanted to fit in, to belong, right? After all, have any of you ever wanted to fit in? You wanted to fit in, to belong? I bet if we went around the room, we could find some strange stories about that. I think most of us would answer, yes, I want to fit in. I want to belong most of the time. It's a very human thing, I think. And the few people who would say, no, 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 I don't want to fit in, are rather happy with not fitting in. They they like that. And that's okay. But here, I'd like for us to take a moment and ask ourselves, don't you think we do some really weird things when we're trying to belong? And I, of course, have an example for us this morning. And in order to do so, we're going to be panning back about six years in the life of Pastor Josh to the absolute silliest Amazon purchase I have ever made. Um, And yeah, that shows up pretty good, doesn't it? (laughs) Um, Isn't it wonderful that we have the internet to remind us about all the silly things that we've done in our life now? Uh, Got Facebook memories popping up. Look at this embarrassing photo from you from 10 years ago. Don't you love that? Uh, um, So it may or may not surprise you But as I was growing up, my parents, uh, they were very money-wise. They were maybe even a bit frugal. And I'm quite grateful for that, actually. It's taught me some very wise money habits in my life now. But I want to ask you a question. If you are a teenage boy who's growing about three inches every two months and ripping all of his blue jeans whenever he goes to work, what kind of blue jeans do you buy for such a son if you're a good money wise parent you 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 buy the two for ten dollar walmart jeans don't you (laughs) that that's those are the kind of jeans that i grew up on but there was something that i knew about two for ten dollar walmart jeans two for ten walmart jeans were not very cool in high school (laughs) no 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 they weren't so i had these two for ten walmart jeans And as I'm going into, I was a part of the Future Farmers of America, I know, shocking, in high school. Yeah, it's all right to laugh. I laugh. Anyway, I was in the Future, and I had these friends in the Future Farmers of America, and they did not have two for $10 Walmart jeans. They had the fancy cowboy jeans. They had the cinch white label cowboy jeans. And you know what I wanted? I wanted to be like them. So you know what I did? armed with my credit union Visa debit card and a brand newly created Amazon account, I ordered myself a pair of jeans that I still have today. $60 jeans, and then alongside that, with my cowboy jeans, I had to have my cowboy boot cleaner and my cowboy boot conditioner. Can you believe that? I was going to be a cowboy, y'all. The only thing I was missing was a Willie Nelson CD. (laughs) But as I'm doing that, I'm a little bit nervous about how are my parents going to respond to this? This silly boy, he he ain't getting $5 Walmart jeans. He's getting $60 Amazon jeans. What is wrong with this man? So, I very stealthily placed my Amazon order on a day that I knew it would arrive when my parents would work later than I would get off school. So I'm watching that UPS tracking, and I see delivered, and I am booking it on home from school (laughs) to get myself my boot cleaner, my boot conditioner, and my fancy cowboy jeans. And I get home, and you know what I do next? I sneak them in my backpack, and I take my fancy cowboy jeans to school, stick them in my locker, and then I had a pattern for about the next two months until they got a little bit too smelly, 
that I would go to school in my two for 10 Walmart jeans, go to the bathroom at school and change into my cowboy jeans. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> I think there's a reason why we find this a little bit humorous because we all know, not just that I'm an absolute dork now, but we all know, we all know that there's very, something very commonly human about wanting to belong and doing absolutely ridiculous things in an attempt to belong. You, you could tell that I was becoming a cowboy as I put those on, right? <laughs> Ow! I grew up on a little suburb house, you know, I, I worked at the zoo, I kind of at this point knew I was going to be a pastor, I was no cowboy, even with Willie Nelson music playing in my, you know, 2001 Buick as I drove down the road, it wasn't happening. <laughs> but we had this desire to belong, and I think, again, as I've said, that that is a very commonly human desire, that we want to fit in, that we want to belong. And there's this funny thing about this word belong in English. You see, we use this word belong in two different ways. The first is the kind of way that we understand from the story we told, and then from my silly Gene story as well, that we want to belong and be a part of something. You might belong to a significant other or belong to a fishing club or a sports team or a church serving group. And that kind of belonging can be really good for us, doesn't it? I think it can remind us that we were made for relationship with one another and made for relationship with God. But there's something very, very scary and very dehumanizing whenever we switch from that first definition of belonging to the second, and that second understanding of belonging is the sense of being owned. Just like I now own these wonderful cowboy jeans, or like I might own a vacuum cleaner, or like a slave might be owned by their master. You see how that belong word just shifted into a much darker tone. When we apply belonging in this way to other people, it becomes very ugly. And for example, it might be a very good and life-giving thing to feel like you belong at your job. But if you belong to your job, if it controls you, if it owns you, that could be a much less life-giving thing. And this is where Israel finds themselves in our story this morning. They find themselves on the cusp of belonging and belonging to. They wanted to belong with the other nations, but instead they wound up belonging to a king and to many kings who never had their best interest in mind. To put it another way, they wanted to fit in, but they wound up possessed. So let's go back to this passage and get into a little bit of nerdy stuff that I like. Uh -huh. In verse 4, the leaders of Israel, they come to Samuel and they say, give us a king to judge us, like all the other nations have. And this word judge is a fun word to say, it's shafat in the original Hebrew. And what this word means is it's the action of a judge. It's this act of leading or of kind of administering. It's a, it's a leading word. Um, and never mind the fact that God had been giving Israel judges for three to five hundred years at this point, that God had been supplying leaders like Moses, like Samuel, and so many others. Never mind that. We don't want God's judge. We want to have our own judge. And it's just ripe with irony here because at this point, God has been Israel's Shaphat. He has been leading them out of Egypt into the land with good intentions. But they said, we don't want that anymore. We don't want to trust God to be our king anymore. We want a human king to lead us. And of course, this doesn't go without God's warning. He'll let his people go astray, but he does not without warning. He says, 
You don't get the riches of the kingdom without the king. In verse 9, God instructs Samuel, warn them about the way a king will reign over them. And this word here, reign, is incredibly different from the judge word in a few previous verses. This word reign is malak. And what malak is all about is kind of putting the hammer down. It's wielding supreme power. The final word, the only answer, a king will rule with an iron fist. That doesn't sound too good to you, does it? In a nutshell, what God's saying is that if you take me, if you take me off the throne, this isn't going to end well. This king that you trust to lead you will instead enslave you just like you were enslaved back in Egypt. If you forsake me, says God, you will not have a leader to guide you, but you will be owned. You will belong to a king. And if you wonder, that's exactly what happened. You can open up your Bible anytime you please, read through the kings and the chronicles, and you can see how some kings did all right and others were incredibly oppressive, and each and every one of them eventually led down the line to Israel, losing its status of a nation and being carried into exile. And I think this principle holds true in our lives today, that we have kind of this throne in our life, And what we put on this throne is what's most important. It's what we put our trust in. It's what we prioritize, and it's what leads our decisions. And the trouble is that whenever something besides God goes on this throne, we don't own it. It owns us. When anything besides God is on the throne, it does not belong to us. We belong to it. So you might be asking, to, like me, why do we do that? Why would we ever put anything besides God on the throne if we're following along here? If anything that we put on there is going to own us. I think oftentimes we fool ourselves we think that, that that really can't be too bad. You know what? There's nothing wrong with this pair of blue jeans, right? Nothing wrong with them. Just a pair of blue jeans. And you know what? I, these, are my, these are my working jeans today. I wore them to Lake Placid. I did some good work in these jeans. These are good jeans. Lasted me over six years, and they're still going. And that desire to belong, like, that's a good thing, too. God doesn't want me to be lonely. I, I, I should belong with that group. We talk ourselves into this. It doesn't sound bad. Because sometimes the things that we want to put on the throne, they're not bad things. They're good things. But they aren't good things to own us. And when we end up putting something besides God on the throne, we not only miss out on God's goodness, but we miss out on the goodness he may have intended for what we put there. It wasn't to say a pair of blue jeans really on the throne back six years ago for me. But I had placed on the throne this desire for connection above the king. And this sense of belonging and desiring after that took me away from the identity that God had created me with. I was trying to be something I was not, and it was pulling me away from the calling I knew he had in my life. It was something I had to give up and dethrone in order to accept his calling on my life to be a preacher and to live for him. So I think whenever we go back to this passage, every preacher's got three good points, right? We're gonna find three motivations of Israel's leaders that led them to putting three different things on the throne. And I think we can take from that a little bit of understanding about ourselves this morning if we would examine ourselves and allow the Holy Spirit to examine us this morning. 
the first motivation of these leaders was they were afraid of how Samuel's sons would rule. In verse 5, it says, Look, you are now old, and your sons are not like you. Don't you know that fear is a powerful motivator? It tempts us to take off God from the throne and to place on it something that we think we can control. Because if we could just control it, then maybe this won't be so scary. In kind of spiritual formation terms, we talk about this as putting something that we have on the throne. Because if it's something that belongs to us, then we can control it, right? But really, when we put something that we have on the throne, again, it belong, we belong to it. We think it's a good thing. For example, the comfort that we may have. We can put our comfort that we have on the throne. And we think this is a good thing. It's comfort from God, right? That's scriptural. But in reality, it may own us. And it may limit what God can do in the kingdom through us. If we place a willingness to be comfortable on the throne over a willingness to say yes to God's glory, then we can miss out. And that's what's on the throne. We can also place possessions on the throne. Something that belongs to me can go there. Oh, when I just have this thing, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be fulfilled. We can put a relationship on the throne that once, I, once I'm dating, then I'm going to be happy. Then when we get married, it's only going to get better. We can place wealth on the throne or a desire for more and more and more. But here's the thing. Whenever we put something that we have or that we want on the throne, it can seem like a blessing from God, but in reality, it's just leading us to chase after things that are not God. Whatever is on the throne is what leads our life. The second motivation of Israel's leaders comes again actually in verse 5 and in verse 20. It was important enough to say twice. They said, we want to be like the other nations. The desire to fit in and belong can be a good thing, as I've said. It reminds us of our need for relationship with God and one another. But we may find ourselves if we buy into this lie that we are what other people say about us, we may prize connection over the king and we may place others or others' public opinion, what they say on the throne. And when we do this, we do kind of ridiculous things. We buy a $60 pair of cowboy jeans when we're certainly not cowboys. <laughs> we might get into a relationship, not because we think that it's a good and God-honoring relationship, but because we crave the validation that comes from that person or from those who are in our social circle. We might justify, you know, putting others' opinions or this connection on the throne because, you know what, God doesn't want us to be lonely. You know, it just feels so good to be affirmed by someone else. But if someone else's opinion or if a relationship is on the throne, that is what will lead your life. And they can only lead you further from God because they are not God. And this final re reason that the leaders give us is because they wanted leadership. They wanted protection. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle, they said. They wanted security. They wanted to be nationally significant. And these aren't necessarily bad things. And we may even personally in our lives seek after security and even some personal success or accomplishment through the things that we do. In fact, we might sometimes even call this putting ourselves on the throne 
yeah, I'm in control. Never mind what God's word says. I'm going to live with who I want to live, and I'm going to watch the entertainment that I want to watch. Because I'm in control. We see how this mentality does damage to the world around us and to the people in our lives. While putting anything besides Jesus on the throne is certainly an act of reducing him from king to consultant, this is probably the one that looks like it the most. We might allow, say, a job to dictate our life more than it should. Or we may use a success in our life to justify ongoing unrepentant sin. And you know what? If what we do is on the throne, then we, we may do great things for the church. But if it's about us, if we're on the throne, if it's about what we can do, then that is void of the Spirit. Amen. If we're charging out before God, then we should not be surprised if he's leading us somewhere else and we totally miss it. So I find myself asking myself, what do we do with this? Because some of these words today are heavy words. If we've recognized that something is on the throne besides God, it doesn't do much good just to beat ourselves up about it willy-nilly, does it? The motivations and the habits that take place to put something besides Jesus on the throne, they run deep. They can sometimes be life-controlling and debilitating. And we know that God most often, he works miracles, but most often he takes transformation through time. There's this well-known verse and a well-loved verse that it helps me in this process of testing my life, saying what's on the throne and what needs to happen to keep God in relationship with Jesus there. It comes in Matthew 6, 33, and Jesus is instructing his disciples, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. And this isn't just a blank check for everything to be all right. But here's what it says. When God is on the throne, the things that we have, the things that other people say about us, the things that we do, they have the opportunity to give us life again. Because they aren't controlling us anymore, but they're being led by God's work on the throne. And let me just also say that when God is on the throne, it's not like being owned by something we do, something we have, or what others would say about us. When in relationship with Jesus as our king, that's what we were created for. And when we live into that created identity and that calling that God has for us, that is where we find freedom. Seek the kingdom above all else. Maybe you're wondering right now, asking, is my comfort, is that relationship, is my work or any other part of my life sitting on the throne? God's call is for us to test it. Is your walk with Jesus shaping that aspect of your life? Or is your relationship with Jesus being shaped by that aspect of your life? Test it. Are you ignoring good godly counsel in order to pursue what is a priority to you? These are indicators that something else might be on the throne. And it needs to come down. To live abundantly, to live freely, to actually be able to enjoy the goodness of this world that God intends for us, we cannot be slaves to what we have 
to what others say or to what we do. This isn't about beating ourselves up for a failure, but this is about setting ourselves up for the goodness that God has in our lives. Maybe ask ourselves simply, what am I doing to seek the kingdom of God above all else in my everyday life? If God's on the throne, that question should be simple to answer. Is this indication we have in our story that God created us with a purpose? Created us out of love. And we begin our story there as image bearers of God created good for his purpose. And we know that that's not necessarily all that we see in the world around us and that can be incredibly discouraging. A world in slavery to the things we do, the things we have, and the opinions of others. This is the core of the gospel. That a relationship with King Jesus undoes those bonds. That a relationship with King Jesus is the most freeing thing that you can have. And that in his goodness, we find the goodness in the world around us. To praise and to celebrate one another and to bring others along in the journey. I'd like for us to pray this as we leave this morning. We would offer God a moment to examine our lives. Not because we feel this need out of guilt, but because we know of the goodness that he has for us. Goodness he can only give if he's on the throne. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are your people, called by your name to carry your goodness into this world. We confess, as a people and as people ourselves, that we often put other things on the throne. We place our own comfort ahead of your calling. We place what others think about us on the throne instead of first looking to what you would say about us, the identity that you have called us to. We pray like David did, God have mercy on me. Lead me in your ways, God. With all eyes closed and head bow, I wonder if there's somebody who's in need of prayer, in need to say, I have put something else on the throne. I need to confess that. I need to be prayed for for that, and I need to be liberated from that. If that's you, I'd ask you to raise your hand. I won't call out names. I will just pray for you. Thank you. I see. Thank you. Praise God. The beginning of transformation is recognizing that we are in need of it and that it only comes from one source in our Heavenly Father. God, I pray for those hands that went up and I pray for those who are still wondering what's on the throne of my life? Is my life a never-ending, endless hallelujah, praise to you? Or are there other things that are taking my praise? As we go throughout our week, God, we pray for your presence in our lives to show us where we are placing things on the throne besides you and to guide us in the ways that you would lead us. 
We don't want to be owned by this world. We want to be led by you. We pray in your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. You are dismissed.